Hello, I'm Phil Langton, and I've been a teacher at Hampton for over 20 years. Welcome to Discover Hampton, a podcast that takes you through the school gates and into the classrooms, meeting teachers and pupils, and getting an insight into what today's young people are loving to learn and why. In this, our first series, we're unlocking the wonder of languages, maths, science and English, history and music. Today on Discover Hampton, let's go back in time with Hampton's history department. Hi, I'm Ollie Roberts, and I'm the head of history here at Hampton School. Teaching here is very enjoyable. Pupils' energy and enthusiasm in lessons is fantastic, and I'm constantly impressed by the questions they ask. I love history because there's often no right answer. Topics can be debated and discussed, and we aim to do this in lessons as much as possible. It's always wonderful to see pupils in a heated discussion about what was the greatest achievement of the early Muslim world, the main reason for the start of World War II, or who was the greatest Tudor monarch. Today, we're going to be looking at an infamous person in English history, Mary I, or as many of you may know her, Bloody Mary. The pupils are going to be examining the differing interpretations of Mary and considering whether she really deserved the poor portrayal she's often given. Well, welcome second year to to history. I really hope that you enjoyed your reading that you did for a little bit of homework on Mary the First, otherwise known to many as Bloody Mary. Okay, and we're going to have a little discussion today about whether that reputation is deserved or not. Can anyone read out this? Who'd like to read out the, the, the nurse from to us? Alex, go for it. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Now, probably this nursery rhyme is really read to sort of people a bit more, a bit older than you, but like to my age was kind of, you know, when actually this was a bit more popular. So you may not have come across it, but um, what I'd like to do is try and pick this apart because it's not for certain, but this, this nursery rhyme is likely about Mary the First. Okay, it's likely about Bloody Mary. And there are a lot of things that we can pick out from this nursery rhyme that demonstrate some aspects of Mary the First's reign. Okay, so I'm just going to read it again just so we can, we've got that in our head. So, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. And this sounds like quite a nice nursery rhyme, but actually, once we dig into it, I'm not so sure. Would anyone like to pick a line and say what they found out about it when they were doing some of the reading. Fred, start us off, please. So I found out that cockle shells were actually an instrument of torture that Mary used on Protestants. So, because Protestants, obviously, Mary wanted to bring back Catholicism into U- into the United Kingdom. She was trying to take out all the Protestants who were against Catholicism, and the cockle shell was one of those torture devices that she used on the Protestants, and also she burned them as well. Very good, okay, so, Cockle shells a reference that torture, and you really well done for bringing out the ideas of sort of yeah, this is she was a she was anti-Protestant, she was fiercely Catholic, and so she yes yeah, she did torture Protestants. Joe, what did you want to say? Yeah, uh, Fred's line actually links into the first line as well. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, because uh, as contrary means opposite. Mary was uh, somebody who went against her brother's um change into protestantism mm. change the country back into catholicism mm. so that links up with why she tortured the protestants uh because she was trying to turn the country back into a catholic country really lovely point i love the fact you're linking those two together excellent work well done joe samrath um for the line with silver bells it could be a reference to wedding bells because she married philip of spain mm-hmm. who was catholic and many people thought was a threat to england Really well done, okay? So with silver bells, yeah, those wedding bells, the idea of Philip of Spain, maybe we'll pick that apart a little bit more in a second. Digby? Well, and as well as that, the line and pretty maids all in a row is quite a very harsh jibe of the fact that she had multiple stillborn babies mm. and there is um, rumour be that she had them buried in her garden. Good, so the, uh, the idea of these babies being the, the pretty maids all in a row. So already we're picking up the fact that this... You know, quite sweet sounding nursery rhyme, which you can imagine mothers reading to their children, has some pretty horrible sort of connotations behind it. Alex? Um, and how does your garden grow? It's, your garden is kind of referring to our country, mm. um, and it's kind of mocking her for, because she's supposed to be being good to all the people, but in reality, she's just 
torturing them. Like, in five years of rain, she had 284 burnings, I think it was. Really great statistic there. Um, well, not a great statistic, but a, an interesting statistic <laughs> yeah. there, um, Alex. Well done. Yeah, so talking about, okay, well, how is your, how is your country doing? Well, actually, if you're having to burn lots of people, perhaps not so well. Digby. Uh, as well, another thing about how does your garden grow, um, I also discovered that it was... Hi, I'm Digby, and I so enjoy learning history at Hampton because of all the analytical skills we learn and the way we look at so many different sources and are allowed to form our own separate interpretations of what we believe. Hi, I'm Samarith. I really enjoy learning history because of all the really interactive lessons and all the really fun trips we get to go on. Now, let's try and think about the reverse side. Did anyone find out anything, actually, that you know, was positive about Mary's reign? Anything that perhaps, you know... Would, would challenge this nursery rhyme, would challenge the idea of Bloody Mary. Go on, Jane. I think I read somewhere that Mary, even though she may not have had a very good relationship with uh, Prince Philip, mm. it did secure like allies, um, alliances with Spain, and uh, I think Spain was sort of controlling the Netherlands at that point. So um, that did secure a lot of alliances. Really good point. You know, she put England on the map a little bit. You know, she she was able to by this by marrying Philip. You know, she gained really strong alliances with Spain. And yes, some people in England didn't like that, but you've got to give her credit for having the kind of political idea to do that. So really, really well done. Okay, Fred. She was actually a very devout Catholic up mm. until thirty-seven years old. Um, she was unmarried, so she was so she was really into her cause, even though obviously the way she attempted to go about removing Protestant laws weren't that good. At least she was actually very devout a devout to her cause. Very good. Really good point, Fred. We'll go Samrith then Digby. Samrith. Well, she brought Catholicism back, but everyone was really fed up at her, and I don't think that's her fault because the other rulers did do this, but they didn't get as much like rebellion afterwards because I think they were just a bit fed up of, well, now we have to be this religion. And then like 10 years later, you have to change religion again. So it's not necessarily her fault, it's just the situation that she found herself. Brilliant, just challenging kind of what you, you know, you've got that in the text there, but you challenge that's wonderful sound, really well done. Fascinating to hear our lower school pupils debating the topic. Now we join senior Hamptonians to get their insight on the subject of Mary the First. Hi there, boys. Um, today we're going to talk about Mary the First, more commonly known perhaps as Bloody Mary. And we're going to be doing an examination of her reign through looking at a source or extract from Elton, a traditional historian who was writing in the 1970s and has a fairly, well, very traditional view over Mary. In front of you, you've got this extract. The reign of Mary Tudor lasted only five years, but it left an indelible impression. Positive achievements, there were none. Pollard declared that sterility was its conclusive note, and, that, and this is a verdict with which the dispassionate observer must agree. All her good qualities went for naught because she lacked the essentials. Two things dominated her mind, her religion and her Spanish descent. In the place of the Tudor secular temper, cool political sense and firm identification with England and the English, she put a passionate devotion to the Catholic religion and to Rome. Absence of political guile and pride in being Spanish. The result cannot be a surprise. She died only five years later, execrated by nearly all. Her life was one of almost unrelieved tragedy, but the pity which this naturally excites must not obscure the obstinate wrongheadedness of her rule. And I thought it'd be nice to use this as a, a start for us to begin a discussion around Mary the First, or actually she's known as, sort of to, to most people, Bloody Mary, and whether actually she deserves that reputation. Now, I'd just like one of you just to pick out a couple of quotes that you think might kind of demonstrate what Elton's trying to sort of put forward as argument about Mary. Can anyone do that for me? Tom, go for it. Well, I think the most important quote is him saying that positive achievements, there were none, just in the, in the second sentence. What, it, what, he's try, what he's really trying to show is that her, her reign was a complete failure, and he's telling us that from the start, he's not going to tell us anything that was successful. He's not going to tell us anything which might have slightly improved uh, her reign because what a lot of us know about are some of the terrible things that happened in her reign, but he's not going to try and redeem those. All he wants to do is tell us about those terrible things. 
Very good. Alex, you want to answer that? And I think to, to further Tom point, Tom's point, the fact that he says all her good qualities went for naught because she lacked the essentials, he's recognising that Mary did have good qualities, but he's just further with the fact that he's saying there were no positive achievements. He's recognising it, but he's just saying that the, the level of sort of failure within her radius is so major that they just cannot be considered at all any positives. Lovely. So we've got here up on the board and in front of you a very negative portrayal of Mary the First. From the reading that you've done, what sort of evidence do you think that Elton might be drawing upon to say things like positive achievements, there were none. Her life was one of almost unrelieved tragedy. What sort of things did you find out from your reading that actually back up what Elton is saying? Arvid? In a lot of uh, Elton's mm -hmm. sources, he heavily exaggerates um, her military failures, such mm -hmm. as the English loss of Calais, which was an uh, English possession for over 200 years previously. And he also um, emphasises her use of burning uh, for the crime of heresy. Absolutely. So two really key things which people use to criticise Mary. Her loss of Calais, OK, Calais being uh, you know, kind of England's foothold in the continent and the burning of heretics or people she saw as heretics, Catholics. Yeah, go for it. Mr. I think he also draws upon her fondness for Spain and her very unpopular marriage to Philip. Mm -hmm which uh, did not help her popularity levels. How, how, why did that not help her popularity? Did you get a grip on that? Uh, because she, unlike the other Tudors, seemed not care very much about England, England and being nationalistic. She was trying to impose a foreign church as they saw it. Absolutely. Who, who, which Tudor in particular do you think Elta might be trying to contrast that with? Which Tudor was very nationalistic, liked to go off to war with France and all that sort of thing? Ollie. I think Henry VIII was intensely nationalistic and very Protestant, very against Rome. Mm. Of course, Mary was quite the polar opposite of that. Her marriage especially was kind of controversial because it was to a Habsburg monarch and they had a huge tradition of arranging these big marriages, then taking over, sort of combining their territories. I think it was Burgundy and Spain, all ruled by one monarch. I think it was um, a big worry at the time that um, England would become just another province of like... Holy Roman Empire. So let's kind of flip this on its head a little bit. Really good points about why we think Elton's putting forward these, these quite traditional ideas about Mary being, you know, Bloody Mary about being a poor monarch. You know, things that we can pick out from here, you know, obscure to the, um, the obstinate wrong-headedness of her rule. Her good qualities went for naught because she lacked the essentials, OK? He is really critical of her. Let's now argue against Elton. Let's flip it. What sort of things did you find out from the reading which showed actually, no, Mary is quite a successful monarch. Mary needs to be viewed in a different light. What sort of stuff did we find out there? Alec? I think it starts before she's even sort of on the throne, the way in her sort of early years when she's sort of the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and then she's then put behind Elizabeth in the queue in the sort of the line of succession. So that starts... Hello, my name's Alec. The reason I love history so much at Hampton is the scope both for learning inside and outside the classroom. You have, even within your course, your teacher might offer you a bit of extra reading or something that allows you to take it beyond just the textbook. And I think that's fascinating for developing a greater sort of understanding. And I think that's helped me to have a passion for history further blossom, where I've been like, right, this, this talk on apartheid or this debate about the East India Company has just developed me so much more as a person and my historical understanding outside of the classic sort of textbook. Hi, I'm Ollie, and I've been studying history at Hampton since I joined in third year. I've developed such a passion and interest for it because of Hampton's amazing teaching that I'm considering study at university, especially because of the history extension classes we've been able to take advantage of this year. Really lovely point. I think the fact that you're, you know, you're drawing attention to the fact, yeah, Mary, the first queen in her own right of England, that's a huge achievement. Mm. You know, just in the fact that she was, she was able to take the throne, continue the Tudor dynasty, really important. Tom? Well, going back to what Alex said about how she took the throne uh, through rebelling against Lady Jane Grey, she would have been, of course, very aware that the same thing could happen to her. But when the same thing did happen to her in 1554, she was incredibly strong while facing it. She refused to leave London, and, you know, and she gave an incredible speech at the Guildhall. She was very good at uh, rousing uh, everyone uh, around her to her cause. And she was very strong again when they came to London, she shut them out and they were forced to lay down their arms. Now, what this shows is that she did have good qualities and that she was incredibly strong if anyone dared uh, challenge her authority. And she also dealt with it very, very efficiently, which cannot be said for some previous Tudor monarchs, such as Henry VII, who had to deal with pretenders during lots of his reign, whereas Mary 
you know, she comes to the throne a year later, she's already been challenged, but within a few weeks, it's over. Really nice point. I think you're referring to Wyatt's Rebellion there. Yes, Wyatt's um, Rebellion. Fantastic. Sorry. Yeah, really good. And she showed her leadership. Yeah, that speech to the guild all really important in stopping that rebellion against her. A lovely example. Well done. Let's go to Rishi then, Arvid. And even beyond these times of tremendous danger, right, like the Wyatt Rebellion, like when she got control, right? I mean, of course, those were incredible, right? I mean, if I was a Hollywood producer, I'll be looking at my Tudor <laughs> textbook trying to make something out of this. But even in times of relative peace, when things were a little bit more stable, she was still... Uh, exhibiting what I see is some extremely positive qualities because for example there was a ambassador from Venice comes over to England sees what Mary is up to and well he's glowing in praise let me quote at daybreak when after saying her praise and hearing mass in private she would transact business incessantly until after midnight I'll be honest Mr Elton this seems like an extremely positive quality to me Absolutely, I think that's, that's a really good point. Hard working, okay, she, you know, yes, she hadn't been brought up to be a queen, but she was sort of, you know, she was hard working, she was ready for it, and yeah. So, the overriding question, how convincing do we think that Elton's argument is? You know, do we think that he is, you know, he has validity, that we should be listening to him? Or actually, at our core, do we really believe that, you know, Mary needs to be reassessed, she needs to be painted in a much better light than what traditional historians um, kind of usually usually say. Let's go, Alec. I think the idea of, I'm sure all of us have sort of had the Bloody Mary idea sort of drum through. And I think that sort of stems in a part from Elizabeth, start of Elizabeth's reign, obviously the move back to Protestantism and the desire to sort of pump out as much sort of propaganda and things like that, sort of disdain uh, Mary's reign as much as possible because religion is such an important part of sort of medieval life and sort of late medieval. So the fact that changing religion again back to Protestantism is possibly going to be very unpopular. So they've got to sort of discredit it as much as possible at the start of Elizabeth's reign. And there's another one that sort of says she's above the law because the law for how a king, uh, sort of a monarch can act is only written for kings. And obviously she's the first queen. She doesn't apply to that. But she sort of goes again and says, no, I want to do it my way. I'm not going to have these suggestions. And showing that she's not sort of this sometimes character that she's made to sort of seem that she's spying and she'll fold under pressure, that actually she'll stand up for what she believes and what she feels is right. Very good. A really, really nice point. I think that sort of her her stoicism and her kind of like, yeah, I think that was really important there, right? Tom? I was like, I really do agree with Alec on this, but I think in history, you know, there's always two sides mm. to mm. the argument. And I think it's very unfair that Elton has said positive achievements, there were none. Mm. I think this is absolutely ridiculous to say. While uh, a lot of things in her reign did go wrong, it is completely unreasonable to say that there were no positive achievements. Very good point. We've got two more points left, okay? We'll go Rishi, then Matthew, so Rishi. I'm just gonna quickly draw attention to something much further than the mange of England, because from West Africa to Russia, we start to see England establishing some commercial links. And well, we're historians, I'm not a geographer, but even I can tell you, West Africa and Russia are quite some way away from England. So literal centuries before we have planes, even just, good quality ships the fact that england under mary is managing to establish commercial trading links in such distant territories is super impressive to me for example in russia you start to have a company called the moscovy Mus muscovy company the yeah. muscovy company which is the first chartered joint stock company in world history mm. and well this company persists for centuries okay i was hearing about stuff like stuff about this company is recently it's the 20th century and this starts with mary mm. okay and well another positive achievement no very good really nice points there is she finally matthew yeah so one of elton's main criticisms of mary is that her religion dominated her mind mm. but i find that an odd criticism considering that henry the eighth you know he completely destroyed the church as it as it was over like getting divorced edward her brother was bringing us to really extreme protestantism and while Mary, well, Elizabeth didn't actually burn anyone at the stake, you know, she tortured and disavowed about 200 heretics herself. So I think it's just a very unfair criticism and she's very unfairly judged for it. Absolutely, thank you very much. That was a really, really impressive dissection of that extract. Really well done to all of you. Some lovely points made. I think we've come to the conclusion here that Elton's interpretation of Mary is perhaps not so convincing, that we really do need to revisit those interpretations of Mary and look at what somebody like Whitelock says about the fact that Mary was actually quite a progressive, impressive ruler in so many ways. And you guys brought that through really, really well. So thank you very much and have a really good rest of your day. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I hope you enjoyed listening to the discussion by both our second years and lower sixth. These are the sorts of conversations that happen regularly in the history classroom at Hampton. History and the skills it provides you, such as communication, debating, presentation and empathy, are all invaluable, whatever path you choose to follow in life. Joe Biden, filmmaker Louis Theroux, and actor-comedian Sasha Baron Cohen and Steve Carell are just some of the famous people you may know who studied history. And I'll leave you with this. We're very lucky to be so near to Hampton Court Palace, and if you've ever visited, you may have seen the real tennis court. Real tennis is an eccentric sport, which I consider a mix between squash, tennis and cricket. There are many interesting rules, such as winning galleries, where if you hit the ball, you win the point, or angular walls that the ball can hit to surprise your opponent. Did you know? The court was built in 1528 by Cardinal Wolsey. Henry VIII played there regularly, and when he played, it was called royal tennis. The traditional image of Henry may have been one of a king who overindulged on food and wine, but in his youth, he was an excellent sportsman and a very good royal tennis player. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed your taste of history here at Hampton. Thank you, Ollie. As any teacher will tell you, we live for those golden light bulb moments when everything clicks into place. And over this series, we'll be witnessing the skill, dedication and passion that great teachers bring to their lessons in Discover Hampton, a podcast from Hampton School. You can find out more at www.hamptonschool.org.uk. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and goodbye for now.